Hey, look at these two guys right here. Do you think we're ready for a Corvette racing dinner? Don't be hiding. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh, I matched my dad. <laughs> yeah, you do. You know what it is. Corvette racing is 
not only to the history of Corvette, but to Corvette as we go forward. You know, uh, Harlan and his group, Kirk, Taj, they're not just going to work at the beginning of the day to earn a paycheck. They're fully vested in this product. It's, it's like Corvette is our child. There's a lot of different parents, from guy at the factory, to the engineering staff, to the design staff, and obviously to the race team. And obviously to you. Because if the car wasn't important to you, you wouldn't be here tonight. So when we sit on the sidelines and behind the curtain and we're working to build product, I want you to know that we're doing it with you in mind, not just to make a paycheck and get paid on Friday. We want to make sure whatever we're turning out, whether it's a new ZR1 or whether it's going to be the next generation Corvette, we do that with you in mind. That's what drives us. Seeing, seeing this large group of people here at Harlem have to agree, Lee, I mean, think about this. How many car companies are, are having dinners with this many people, but with customers, one-on-one? -on -one? Then nobody does that in the world. No, you don't. You don't no, see this. No, the Ferrari doesn't do sports this. Car companies. Exactly. Porsche doesn't do this. Aston Martin doesn't do this. You know, this is what's so unique about this product, and that's what keeps me so passionate about it. So I want to give you guys a credit. Read, put your hands together for yourselves. Thank okay? you for your support. And Brian and Danny were bummed out. I got to tell you, not only do we have a race coming up in Ohio, trust me, we could plan to get by that. We got enough great people in the shop that could pick up that slack. We could make that happen. But we have another project that we're working on back there. Okay, I don't know what that would be because I can't tell you about it. But there's another project. <laughs> There's another project going on back there that is really what the cause of them uh, not being able to be here tonight because they, the whole team is working double overtime. We're racing and we're building. We've done this before. We did it when we went from C5 to C6. We did it when we went from C6 to C7 and we're doing it right now from our current product to whatever the future's gonna hold for us. So those guys, are we ready with the video? We're going to talk. We're going to show a little bit about what we did last year. I'm going to spend a couple minutes talking about what we did last year, a couple minutes about what we did this year, and then we'll open it up to questions on the floor. That sound like a plan? Good plan. All right. Can we, can we, can we show that video? Normally these cars make noise. <laughs> Is, is, is there no audio? I guess there is no audio. I don't see anybody. Can we start over? This is something we don't get to do in real life in racing. We believe even the most successful team has room for improvement. Improvement growth. Is a theme that runs deep at Corvette Racing. It is rough down this front straightaway. DT will cover about 155 miles an hour. Watch this. Dives to the inside. Huge commitment there. Look at the wall on the left. Extra to the right. Teamwork and dedication to victory. We will never stop learning. Throughout the season, there are a handful of moments that define your success. For Corvette, in 2017, Antonio Garcia's drive to Seabrook was the first.
big picture of success. Rather than the top step on the podium in each race, is what sets apart champions from the rap. Synergy between bit work, strategy, and race setup creates a well-oiled machine. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. because I know the effort that these people put into making that happen. Three car won that championship, and we won a couple races that year. But here's a statistic that doesn't get talked about very often. That car, that free car, finished on the lead lap, completing every single lap of every single race. Durability, reliability, performance, and preparation. Not necessarily the fastest car, but certainly the best car and the best team. That's what brings championships home, and that's what we do. And, and I think that this little video pretty much captured, captured all of that. And it, it makes all of us, I know, stand up on the stage, and, and I can tell by your reaction as you watch that, it makes all of you really proud, and that's what makes racing so darn much fun. And that's what keeps us plugged in and, and, and going full speed, and that's why we're here tonight. So, so the question really is, why do we get our ass kicked if they don't have the money back? That's pretty much it. I think, uh, you know, the, the Daytona in and of itself is a, is, is a unique entity, much like Le Mans is in the World Endurance Championship Series. Uh, it has a different set of parameters. You know, you, you have your real option there. Do you want to set the car up with low downforce and high speed on high banks, then you can't turn it and stop it? Or do you want to dial in more downforce so you're good on the infield and then you're giving it up and having, you know, every slacker in the group run, drive by on high banks. So, the Daytona is unique and the sanctioned body is trying to come to grips with creating a proper balance of performance there. They just implemented the balance of performance from the year before Petit Le Mans, which was arguably one of the closest, best long, long distance races that we've had in the U.S. And it didn't work at Daytona. So that was, and, and, and by their own admission it was an abject failure, so we're working to, to increase that. Moving to Long Beach, Long Beach is, I mean, I, Long Beach isn't really even a race. So first of all, it's only nine minutes long, you got one pit stop, all right? The reality of it becomes, it's important to try and qualify well there because it's hard to pass. So if you get out front early and the cars are evenly matched, tough for anybody to get by anybody. Secondly, your pit stop, both your execution and your timing of the pit stop, where it occurs during the race, and your ability to get in and out, is usually gonna determine the winner. And I think this, this year's race, presented that case full frontal. You know, I, think we, I think we were running fourth and sixth when we came in for the pit stop, and we came out second and fourth. And then the lead BMW had pitted earlier in that race, and had it was gonna, they weren't gonna make it. So whoever came out in the pit second had a good chance to win. Uh, unfortunately, it was Antonio who came out second, and then we had a, electrical gremlin in the shift mechanism in the car and he went from second to dead last. Tommy was fourth, worked his way up the front. Long Beach is a lot of luck, but good preparation and you gotta have great driving. You gotta have very skilled guys. That's really the, the two things. You couldn't, in the full racing spectrum, you couldn't pick two races that were further apart from one another from what it takes to win. 
But, you know, did everybody hear that question? All right, the question was, what does it mean to Corvette Racing when we show uh, the live uh, stream of the Law 24-hour race? You know, we do that here in the theater. Everybody aware of that? Yeah. Okay, we're, we're doing that again this year. Um, I I'll tell you what it means. First off, I, had the, I was approached by the ACO. They're the organizers of the race. They wanted to expand um, the viewership in the U.S. and the awareness in the U.S. of the 24 Hours of Le Mans. Le Mans is a huge deal, guys. Uh, not, not just for us because we're into racing, but around the world. You know, there's 350,000 people that attend that event. And it's watched on TV live by just south of a billion people in the world. A billion people. It's popular every place but you. So they came and said, yeah. so we said, what, 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 what can we do? I said, well, let's, you know, I, I want to put something together at the Corvette Museum. What do they, I said, they got a theater, I mean, it's a big screen, I mean, it'd be a cool deal, we got our fans. There's only three places in the world that get to see this thing live stream, okay? One is in Germany, the other is in Tokyo, Japan, and the third is right here in Bolingbrook, Kentucky. And for all those I think that have attended over the last couple of years that we've done this, each year it's gotten bigger, each year it's gotten better. I'll be honest with you, I, I kind of wish I could watch it here. <laughs> better bathrooms and food I can eat. <laughs> uh, apparently there's a feeling out there that we're getting ready to introduce the next generation race car. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there is. There just is. And it's understandable. I mean, you know, C7's been around for a while. And there's got to be a C8 at some point in time. Um, uh, the, the reality of it is, when you look at the, at, the, at the global timing of things, the real heart of the question is, why didn't we, why, why aren't we homologating uh, ZR1 as our next-gen Corvette? Okay? The reality of it is, if we, if, if we were to do that, and we can do that any time, if we were to homologate ZR1, we have to stick with that homologation for three years. Okay? I think you can do the rest of the math, can't you? Okay, that answers your question? That is the reason. All right. I don't know if you know, but Marlon is sweating up here right now. There's a C8R, and it'll be start racing as soon as we're done racing the C7R. Yeah. <laughs> and having done this all my life and, and grown up in Detroit and know nothing about automotive, I can tell you that there is not another manufacturer in the world that has one-on-one -on -one relationships with their customers and uses that to determine what they're going to build. And I think the testament to being able to do that, like we do it at Corvette and, and Harlan's group does, is I think initially when, when they decided they were going to uh, have the flexibility, which Kai, by the way, how about a plant that can change over and build? Uh, I, I think we had projected that we thought probably on total sales, then maybe a grand score would be a 15% deal. Maybe the tops would be 20%. And last full production year was like 2016. We're running up like 35% now. Grand Sport's our number one model right now. It's yeah. actually higher than the Stingray for 2019. So how about this for a new concept? Ask the customer what he wants, build it, and sell it to him. <laughs> Hello. Great job, by the way. He's the one that really turned the Corvette into a world-class sports car. Um, actually, there's a story um, back in the 50s when he first started at, at uh, Chevrolet Engineering. He, he uh, would take time off and race at Le Mans and actually uh, drove the Porsche and actually told them how to make that car with its poor you know, weight distribution situation handle well. He basically taught them how to make cars handle, and then of course he made the Corvette even better. So Zora is somebody we, we look up to. Zora always wanted 
um, the Corvette to be involved in racing, and you talk about breaking rules. Zora really knew how to, like, he got away with stuff that back then when there was a total ban on racing. Zora creates the Grand Sport Corvette to go up against the, the, the Cobra. And then he created uh, the Serve One, which is basically a modern Formula One car when we get a ban on racing. So, um, all in the name of Corvette Engineering. So, um, I think. Zora would be very proud of Corvette racing where it's come today. I think it's probably the dream that he'd always envisioned that we are taking on, like I said, taking on Europe and beating them. And uh, I think he'd be very proud of what we're doing, but we hold Zora as a high standard of, of kind of the ultimate Corvette engineer and um, always think we have a, uh, we do have a slogan, and Ed, at, at Piatek, who works with us at, at, at Corvette Engineering, is here, and he has, uh, you know, what would Zora do? You know, as a slogan. So when we have to make a tough engineering decision on on either racing or production, we always wonder what would Zora do. And uh, and people who make good decisions get a uh, get a bracelet, get a special what would Zora do bracelet. I've been around long enough, although I had the opportunity to meet Zora. Zora, I've worked with every chief engineer on Corvette, with the exception of Zora. So, uh, my, my history there is long. I, um, I've spent a lot of time, and there have been books written, the most recent book uh, written on, on Zora's life. And uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm, I may not be, to some degree, the reincarnated of Zora, because I don't, I, I don't like let me, let me rephrase that. If I see something that I think is right and is good and needs to be done, I try and break down those barriers that prevent that from happening. And if I can't break them down, I go around them. <laughs> and that's kind of that's kind of how, how Zora got us to where we are today. Zora had a passion, he had a fire, and he had a belief. He had the knowledge and he had the people. And he put those together and he knew at the end of the day that he would be proven right despite who he may crank off in the process. And he succeeded at, at doing that. And we owe everything we have today to him because without him, and obviously his team of people and those that, that came behind him, um, this brand would have been dead a long time ago. And we just refused to let that happen. And that's part of what drives me going forward. And I know it drives these guys. Uh, we, we love this car, we love this brand, and, and we're faced with hurdles every single day. And the, the challenge is to find a way to overcome and, and know what, what would Zora do is the way you get that done, because he didn't let anything get in his way. I, I love the guy, I only met him twice, so.